My presentation is uh, about the ASEAN plus three region in the global value network. Uh, it's based on our flagship report, the ARIO uh, 2020, which came out in April of this year. Uh, so there are two parts to the report. Uh, uh, the first part is on the macroeconomic prospect and challenges. And then the second part is on the thematic uh, chapter about the structural challenges facing the region. Uh, so I will focus more on the second part, uh, but uh, I'll go quickly over the first part. Uh, the first part is a bit dated, as you can imagine, because uh, when we prepared the report, uh, it was before the COVID pandemic hit. <laughs> so it was a big challenge in trying to complete the report because we had to keep constantly update our forecast. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, even though it was launched in April, we have since updated our uh, uh, outlook and also some of the developments. Uh, so I'll take you quickly through that part of it. Uh, the second part is supposed to, you know, focus on the challenges facing the region. Uh, we've been, it's part of our ongoing study of the growth strategy in the region. And some of you who uh, attended our uh, seminar last year would know that, uh, you know, we are much very interested in this uh, growth strategy, whether it's still relevant and, and, you know, how and whether the region can continue to sustain its growth and catch up with the, the, the advanced economy. And we, we, are, we were a bit concerned about the protectionist uh, uh, environment, you know, uh, at that time. Uh, that was before uh, COVID uh, pandemic uh, uh, happened. But as it turns out, I think the, the, the team is still very relevant because going forward, as, as you can imagine, uh, the challenges have remained pretty much the same, although, you know, uh, it has been affected by the pandemic and the recovery of the region will be affected as well. Uh, so this, we normally start with this uh, global risk map. Uh, so the bubbles are the so-called risks uh, facing the region. Uh, this is quite different from what you will see in the, uh, uh, the REO 2020, the Outflexion Report. Uh, as you can see from, from the bubbles, we are concerned about in the, the risk of a second wave, uh, you know, hitting the region as well as uh, Europe and US, um, especially, you know, there's a, a bit of pressure to open up uh, even before, you know, the, uh, the virus has been fully contained. And we see that already happening in the US in some states, you know, where the, uh, the infection rate spike up again. We're also concerned about uh, the risk of a potential of a financial crisis because of the huge uh, stimulus package uh, the countries have to adopt in order to, uh, to basically support the economy through this period. And then of course the debt, the sovereign debt, uh, you know, is going to go, go up. Uh, so the, the risk of uh, a sovereign debt crisis is also there. And finally, uh, we, we worry about uh, the escalation of the US-China trade conflict. Uh, for a while we thought, you know, we phase one, uh, things have come down and, you know, looking brighter but it looks like uh, things have gotten even worse uh, with this uh, pandemic. So very quickly, this is our uh, heat map chart about uh, developments in the region. Uh, on the left hand side, you see the PMI heat map. Uh, basically green means that the economy is doing well, uh, it's growing, and yellow means they're slowing down. So you can see the, the color changing from green to yellow to red in 2020, and very abruptly, right? And that's because of the pandemic. Uh, all of a sudden, everything comes to a halt. Uh, production comes to a halt. And so, you know, the, the color turns red. It's beginning to turn uh, less red, but you cannot see it in, in, in the chart, unfortunately. So there, since uh, April, you know, uh, the region is uh, beginning to recover. Uh, but it's still negative growth. It's just less negative. And on the right-hand side, uh, you see uh, basically the body dry index, which is a proxy for trade, you know. And you can see that it's very negative uh, at the bottom there, uh, at least in the uh, early part of this year, although it's beginning to turn around. <clears throat> uh, okay, these two chart basically uh, on the left-hand side shows trade, uh, which has, uh, was hit badly last year because of the tr trade conflict between the US and China. And it's beginning to turn around uh, in uh, you know, uh, early this year. 
Uh, and on the right-hand side, uh, air travel has basically collapsed in the region. Uh, the red line here is, is for China. And you can see that because China is ahead of the most of the countries in the region, air travel has actually picked up some. But for most of the other countries, air travel is still very, very weak. And this has you know, hit tourism very badly. <laughs> And this is the market. The uh, market basically collapsed in March, uh, you know, when the uh, pandemic hit the US uh, and, and market collapsed. And then the Fed came in and pumped in a lot of liquidity. And since then, the market has more or less uh, recovered gradually, not to the same extent as in the US, but you can see that it's uh, sort of uh, recovered somewhat. And the currency took a hit again in March, mostly in and, and April, but then since then it has uh, also recovered. And same thing on the bond side, uh, yields sort of uh, spike up very sharply and then it's beginning to close. So market is more or less stabilized. Uh, I think the region has done well in terms of managing the, the shocks uh, on the market. Uh, so this is the, the COVID curve. Uh, you can see that the, the, you know, this is the total number of cases and it's sort of flattened off uh, for China, which is ahead of the, the uh, most countries in the region. Uh, they came out of it you know, sometime in, uh, uh, March uh, and they started opening up and for most of the other countries as well you can see that the curve has flattened off with the exception of Indonesia and Philippines uh, they are still uh, haven't quite flattened off yet they're still rising and Singapore to some extent but Singapore as we know is because of the foreign workers problem and if you look at this the community infection is sort of flat uh, much, much flatter now uh, so all the countries uh, are beginning to open up uh, uh, you know, in different phases, uh, you want. and on the right hand side is our heat map on readiness of the countries to open up. Uh, and as you can see, it's turned from red to green, uh, which means that you know countries are in different stages of readiness to open up. Huh? And so this is my uh, outlook for the region. Uh, this was the uh, early part of this month. Uh, early June the 2nd. Uh, so we are projecting that the region will actually uh, grow by 0.3% ASEAN plus 3 region and mainly because of China. China, you know, we expect to grow, that it will grow by 2.3% and that will pull up the growth for the whole region because China is, uh, you know, uh, of the size of the economy. For the ASEAN countries, uh, we expect a negative growth and most of the countries will have negative growth. With the exceptions of the Indochina countries, uh, which, which are doing relatively well, eh? uh, Vietnam, uh, Laos, uh, Cambodia has been hit because it's very uh, narrowly based on tourism and garments, and you know those two sectors have been hit badly. Uh, and also the emerging markets uh, economy in ASEAN, Malaysia, Philippines, uh, in the uh, 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 Singapore and Thailand, they're going to be hit quite badly. So it's, a, it's going to be a very uh, uh, bad year in a sense, uh, and but we expect a, a rebound in the second half and for next year, a uh, growth of 6.2%. 6.2% uh, you know, would, would not be a full recovery as yet uh, because we expect that external headwind will be quite strong. So, but it, nevertheless, it will be a, a, a significant recovery. You know? But as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are you know, obviously risks uh, facing the region because of the risk of the second wave uh, and external headwind. <clears throat> so but let me now move on to the second part of the uh, report, which is on the global value chain. So um, there are basically uh, five major drivers uh, facing the region. One is, of course, the recovery from the, the current recession. You know? And the recession, there's a lot of headwinds. Uh, and also, you know, uh, damages from the uh, pandemic to balance sheets. Uh, yeah, unemployment is going to shoot up and it's going to take some time to recover. So the, it's going to be quite challenging uh, for the recovery. It's not like SARS where the rebound was very, uh, very quick. Uh, so, and then of course, there's the risk of a second wave. Uh, so, so for all, all those factors, uh, we see the recovery uh, as quite challenging going forward. The second is protectionism, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the, the conflict between the US and China, but not just with China, you know, it's conflict with the US with everybody else. Uh, uh, it's a big risk to the region. Um, and so 
protection is. And on the other hand, uh, the region has been integrating, uh, you know, mostly due to market forces. But more recently, also we they had the CPTPP and the RCEP, you know, the regional arrangement to foster uh, closer regional integration. Uh, but that's and certainly one risk to one challenge to uh, the region in terms of sustaining uh, growth going forward. Uh, how that's going to affect you know the, the outlook. How how much it will shape growth. Uh, you know especially potential growth. The third factor is uh, the fourth industrial or technology more broadly. Uh, I think there's been a lot of concern about the you know, automation and how it's uh, destroying jobs and whether the, the region can continue you know, to uh, grow based on a manufacturing sector. Uh, so that's one, one of the, the factors, the digital technology and how it's affecting the, the prospect for growth. Um, the fourth is the rise of what, what we call the rise of factory Asia. And this is uh, you know, the rapid uh, development of the region supply chain and how the whole region has, has been you know, evolved into uh, <clears throat> highly efficient uh, uh, manufacturing hub for not just the region, but the whole world, right? So that's a very positive aspect, and but the, the issue is how would that be affected by you know the factors that I just identified in terms of protectionism and and also the the fourth industrial revolution, and finally uh, the emergence of what we call shopper Asia, and this is the emergence of a very large and affluent middle class uh, in the region, um, something in the, something that has not been uh, in a focus of attention uh, very much. Uh, because the region basically started, uh, you know, uh, by exporting to the west, and but I think over the years uh, the region has become much more affluent, and as a result, you know, there's a very large uh, and affluent middle class. There's a reason. So I will start with this: uh, the, the development of Factory Asia. Uh, many of you who have seen this chart. This is basically the flying geese. Uh, 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 it shows the industrialization of the region over over time over the last basically six decades, you know, starting with Japan and the NIEs, uh, which comprise Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and <clears throat> Hong Kong, yeah. So, you know, and you can see that uh, those countries have since then moved on. And then there was a second wave, which comprised the ASEAN Tigers, uh, you know, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, and Indonesia, you know. And then uh, the finally, uh, and also China, which came in a bit later uh, in the second wave. And then uh, in the 90s, uh, the CLMB countries basically uh, also you know, got onto the, the, the industrialization. Uh, so the region has, has basically uh, undertaken what we call the manufacturing for export strategy and industrialized over time uh, very successfully. And as I mentioned, uh, developed probably the most uh, efficient uh, supply, regional supply chain in the world. Um, and because of the industrialization, you can see that reflected in the uh, composition of value added. Uh, basically, this section here is agriculture, and that has shrunk over time within the country as well as across the uh, time as they begin to move up the technological ladder. So, you know, the, for most of the advanced economy, basically the agriculture sector is very small uh, and comprised mostly manufacturing and services sector. You know. So this is a very nice sort of a profile of how the structures of the economy have shifted over time. And on the labor, uh, and it's reflected also in terms of the composition of uh, labor across the economy. And this is where actually a lot of the uh, productivity uh, gain uh, is derived by shifting labor from agriculture to the manufacturing and services sector. So we can see that shift over time uh, within each economy and also over time as you become more advanced, the agriculture sector or the, the share of labor in agriculture shrink over time. Huh? Uh, <clears throat> and one of the concerns, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, the effect of uh, technology on industrialization. Yeah? 
but I think so it's true that industrialization uh hollow out the employment uh and leads to, and makes it much more technology intensive capital intensive and less and less labor intensive uh, so you need to move along with the technology uh, as you go along but what a lot of people don't realize is that uh, if you look at the 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 value chain of most product. This is the automotive value chain, uh, from pre-production to production in the factory, to delivery to the customer, and then the post-sale service. Much of the value chain is services. You know, so what technology has done is basically fragment the the, the value chain uh, and transform services into a product on its own. Uh, so increasingly, manufacturing become service. You know. And which gets then classified as in part of the services sector and the manufacturing sector then shrink as a, as a share of the, the total economy in terms of value add. Um, so if you look at the Thailand, for instance, uh, Thailand has become a bit of a service hub of, for automobile for the region. Huh? Uh, whereas we think of Thailand um, as producing the, the, the goods, <laughs> the, 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 the automobile itself, but uh, it's also uh, actually exporting a lot of services to other countries in the region. <clears throat> Similarly for China, uh, China used to be, you know, I mean, we all see China as a, 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 a factory, you know, producing all kinds of goods and so, but China has evolved into a services hub over time uh, from year 2000 to 2018. Uh, this is the China here in 20, 2000, and this is China in 2018. So you can see that China has grown actually as a services hub uh, over time. Uh, and this is another effect, you know, uh, of uh, technology on the on the manufacturing sector. <clears throat> um, well, the other concern that I, I raised was the protectionism, and in fact, indeed, if you look at some of the indicators, uh, it looks like you know there's been a, a flattening of globalization and the reduction in or even deglobalization. Huh? So there's been a reduction in global trade as a share of uh, GDP, uh, a reduction in global capital flow as a share of GDP, and also in, in uh, migrant uh, foreign labor workers. On the other, and also an increase in you know uh, anti-dumping uh, cases and all that. So all these seems to indicate that you know the world is perhaps uh, moving away from globalization uh, towards uh, deglobalization. On the other hand, uh, the services sector, which is not well captured in, in some of these indicators has been growing actually quite rapidly. Uh, financial services in particular, but all kinds of services, you know. So when you look at the, 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 some of these other indicators, uh, globalization, you know, it had, on the contrary, has actually been growing, uh, maybe not in the traditional areas like goods, uh, trade, but certainly in services and especially in terms of uh, 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 transmission of data and information. Um, and that trend towards deglobalization, de uh, you know, we, we examine it and we found that it's partly because of the global financial crisis and the fact that in the post global financial crisis, uh, the US and Europe economy was relatively weak. So what happened was the region then rebalances the growth towards domestic demand and intra-regional demand uh, trade. Uh, so you can see that the contribution of, of external demand, which is the, the, the share here, has shrunk over time. Huh? Um, and the share of, and so the growth is basically supported much more and more by domestic demand. Uh, and if you look at the this chart here, uh, the contribution of external demand is has declined from 27.4% to 19%. So it's a very sharp reduction in the, uh, you know, uh, the contribution of external uh, demand to total growth, right? Um, I guess some people argue that that has also led to a reduction in potential growth. But uh, if you look at potential the growth for the ASEAN country, it has not actually uh, been relatively stable. I think China is the only country where growth has steadily come down. But that's partly structural, so you know, so we don't think it's related to this uh, shift in the composition. <clears throat> uh, at the same time, uh, you know, 
this this is interesting chart because it shows that a lot of the manufactured goods right is actually consumed within the region as i mentioned earlier there's been a rise in domestic demand as a, as a driver of growth and so you know the, an increasing share of the total uh manufacturer export is now being, being consumed uh, within the region rather than being exported huh? uh, the export section part is actually shrunk over time and if you look at the, the share of the us and europe uh, in terms of the the regional trade it has actually also shrunk from 37 percent uh, to 27 percent you know so all these indicators uh, shows that there has indeed been a reduction in 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 so-called external trade but it's extra regional trade that has really uh, shrunk uh, and that's because um you know europe and us uh, the growth has actually weakened after the global financial crisis and that you know and as a result the region has rebalanced its growth towards more domestic and regional demand <clears throat> and so this chart uh, shows what we call the rise of shopper asia uh, you know, the rise of factory Asia has also allowed the countries to move up the income ladder. And as I mentioned earlier, the first wave of country uh, have pretty much got, you know, become high income advanced economy uh, with, you know, per capita income ranging from 30,000 to 60,000. And then the, the emerging markets or middle income economy has also grown uh, sh sharply in terms of income and they are now in the range of 3,000 to 10,000 you know uh, this is China here uh, the, the red line which is uh, shot, shot up very sharply you know uh, in in the more last two decades basically you know so there's been a sharp rise in income and even for the CLNV countries uh, there's been a significant increase in income from about two three hundred to uh, 1,005 to 2,000 uh, so the region has now, you know, become what they call um, a major source of demand for its own products, right? Uh, and less dependent on the West. So the traditional model of, uh, you know, the, the region producing cheap uh, consumer goods for export to the West is no longer the case. Uh, this is uh, an example of, you know, going forward, what, what this means for, in terms of, uh, uh, demand for goods china has become the, the you know the biggest consumer of luxury product basically you know? uh, so this is a projection by mckinsey uh, which shows that uh, you know the, the share of china in terms of total uh, luxury product it has increased significantly and for the asian plus three region uh, you know going forward will constitute almost 40 plus percent of the total uh, consumer uh, uh, products <clears throat> So what, what does that mean? It means that, you know, um, in, as I mentioned earlier, the traditional uh, growth model where the region you know, produces goods for export to the West is no longer the case. It's mostly producing goods for consumption within the region. So there's a rebalancing of, you know, uh, uh, of growth in, in that sense. Uh, but the, the new consumer uh, affluent middle class that's rising, uh, they are much more demanding and also with the new technology it means that a lot of the products are in the services sector and they need to be customized to the to the needs and uh and demand of the you know the new middle class that emerging in the region um, uh, so the traditional model is still there where you produce a cheap uh, consumer goods uh you know with low cost labor but it's rapidly evolving to the new group uh model where a lot of the production now is 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 directed towards a you know, regional consumption, and this of course requires that you know you need a new infrastructure, new new types of uh, you know connectivity in order to leverage on this uh, increasing uh, integration across the countries. Uh, a good example is tourism. Uh, tourism, you know, is is not predominant. The, the, the bar at the bottom is China, and you can see that the contribution of China to regional tourism has increased uh, tremendously. And we all know that you know, tourism potential is still relatively underdeveloped in many of the countries in the region. So there's a lot more potential to develop the, the tourism sector. But the demand side is, is there also, right, which is very important. Uh, and increasingly, 
the the tourism industry is also undergoing transformation where it's moving away from group tour to a much more customized tourism eco tourism uh, medical tourism you know the, uh, so uh, and with the new technology the with the development of apps and all that you are now able to basically uh, accommodate the needs of the the more demanding tourists over time uh, the other driver of, that I mentioned was the new tech, the fourth industrial revolution or the digital technology. Uh, I think one of the the more promising uh, aspect of the region is that the region is relatively tech savvy and, and uh, very much into uh, tech, uh, embracing the new technology. So e-commerce, you know, as you as you all know, is uh, taken off in the region. Uh, you know, in in China in uh, indonesia it's become a, 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 a it's growing rapidly and ironically the, the pandemic has give as you know given it a boost uh, and accelerated the process and e-commerce in turn is giving the boost to the logistic sector so you know the the the, the technology is transforming uh, the value chain in that sense uh, so traditional uh, industry is going to be disrupted but the digital technology is, is going to lead to new ways of delivery and also consumption. So I come to my uh, final slide, which is protectionism. Uh, so this is a study by the Peterson Institute, uh, which shows you know, the benefit from the CPTPP and RCEP. Uh, and it shows that uh, CPT will boost regional global GDP by 147 billion per year uh, over time. And CPTPP together with RCEP will boost uh, GDP by 333 billion a year. Uh, and with India added on, it will be, go up to 365. And then they did a simulation uh, where, you know, the trade war between US and China escalates. Uh, and they found that that would reduce uh, global GDP by 300, 300 billion, basically. Uh, but with CPTPP and RCEP, uh, it basically offset the the loss on on the other side. Um, so you don't you don't get the, the boost you know as, as you would get uh, if, if there was no trade war. But it, but the CPTPP and RCEP, the effect of, of those two uh, free trade arrangement is that they would offset the, the effect. They actually it boost boost uh, overall GDP somewhat. And the other finding is that it generally will accelerate the integration of the region because the region you know have to move you know uh, inward and that's already ha happened we know uh, since uh, the global financial crisis the rebalancing of growth but it will just accelerate the you know th that rebalancing process and make the in the, in the region even more integrated than before uh, so it's very it's important so Ironically, it's good. It, it may benefit the region, uh, but the region needs to remain uh, open and committed to uh, multi rule-based multilateral uh, trade arrangement. So, let me sum up. Uh, so, I, th I think going forward, we're going to have a very challenging external envir environment. Uh, we don't know if there's going to be a vaccine, and if there's one, it may take another, you know, twelve months of, or eighteen months uh, before it becomes a you know, available, widely available. Uh, there's also uh, protectionism. It seems to be uh, <clears throat> getting stronger uh, going forward. I think even if, uh, you know, uh, Democrat administration would uh, be come in next year, uh, it's unlikely that they would completely revert back to uh, uh, the pre-Trump type of a regime. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there's the restructuring uh, towards the new normal. You know, uh, the the pandemic has really uh, damaged the balance sheet for many corporate, many of the SMEs. You know, uh, so it's going to take it's going to be take a while before for the economy to fully recover. On the other hand, um, you know, I think the the fundamentals in the economy are, are relatively strong. Uh, we have high savings, high investment rate. We have very, uh, the governments here have been fed relatively prudent in terms of the, their budget uh, and the financial systems are sound. 
So the, region, the economy, as I showed earlier, has been pretty resilient to external shocks. Huh? Uh, and this has uh, actually uh, uh, done the region well in terms of uh, meeting this pandemic shock as well. Uh, I think we'll be able to emerge uh, relatively unscathed. Uh, you know. uh, the other is uh, the emergence of Factory Asia and Shopper Asia. Uh, Factory Asia means that you know, the region is relatively competitive, right? Uh, and able now to provide services to the rising middle, middle class. Mm -hmm. And so these two coming together will be a very uh, a strong driver of growth going forward. Uh, the, 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 the region is no longer as dependent on the West as a source of, uh, as a driver for growth as before. Um, and also the region is relatively advanced uh, in the digital technology space. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, they are also very, you know, uh, open to the digital technology. Uh, so I think that's a, a very strong factor for, you know, uh, supporting growth. And finally, I think on, on in terms of the uh, human capital, uh, you know, obviously there is a shortage of skills in the region, but by and large, uh, it's a relatively well-educated workforce, you know, uh, in terms of education and very digitally savvy, you know. So, you know, the fundamentals seem to uh, quite favorable for the region to be able to sustain relatively strong growth going forward. Um, obviously, there are challenges because of this uh, protectionist environment, uh, which may actually shave uh, growth uh, to some extent. But I think the impact on, on, on the region would not be as damaging as it would be uh, without the strong fundamentals that we have.